Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast this evening. I'm delighted to welcome Robin Thorpe. So welcome to the podcast, mate. Cheers, mate. It's been a while. It has, hasn't it? It's taken us a long time to get this done, but I'm absolutely delighted to get you on. Pinned you down just before your haircut in two and a half hours. So hopefully we can get it. Hopefully we can get it all in. But anyone that doesn't know who you are, just want to give us a little bit of back, a uh, little bit of background on you, education-wise, what you've done employment-wise, and what you what you're currently doing now. Yeah, so I'll start at the beginning. Um, was did an undergrad in sports science and computer science. Um, that was at Nottingham Trent University. Um, and you know what I think? We'll probably talk about this a little bit later on. Up until I would say the third year of that that course, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, but then I did my dissertation at the time was looking into some caffeine intervention research in the sort of, we were lucky at the university, we had an environmental chamber. So I sort of simulated the, it was in the lead to the Beijing Olympics, um, which was obviously a long time ago now. And so how sort of caffeine ingestion would affect um, 1500 meter running performance. So that, that really gave me a sort of push. And I realized I was, I was pretty good at some of that sort of research type work and Dr. Caroline Sunderland at the time, who was my dissertation supervisor, she was said, she, she indicated like you could, why you stay on and do a master's, like you've, you've got a talent here. So I did, and then did a master's at the same, same university under, under Caroline and it was a great department at the time. Then it was, it was growing. There was the likes of Craig Sale as well. So it was, a, it was a great education in terms of getting some contemporary understanding of, of what sports science was and how it can be applied. Um, and I embarked on some research um, with a semi-professional football team in the area. And so I did some voluntary work with them and did a, did a study looking at basically immune muscle damage endocrine responses through saliva and blood um, pre and post a competitive game for that team. And at the university at the time, we were the, we were lucky. We were the first to have GPS devices. And back then, as you remember, it's like a brick on the back of your, back of your neck. Um, and so we were able to just look at sort of relationships between what they are actually doing and some of these, again, muscle damage, immune responses pre and post. And I actually published that piece of research which was the the aim at that time was it was a research master's do something that you're interested in you're passionate about and let's see if we can get it published and that's what I did and at the time I was massively into football that was my sort of my background and I just I sent that piece of research to every football team in the UK that I knew had a fitness coach or a sports scientist and back then there was there weren't really departments. There were a couple of people in roles, but that was about it. Um, and then following that, lucky enough that Man United and Tony Shudwick were, they were interested in that piece of work and kept contact with them. And then a job came up and I was shortlisted and thankfully made it through. Um, and so that sort of started my career at, at Manchester United, which was 10, season in, 10 seasons in all. And I went in initially as a sort of general sports scientist um, with some like nutritional support around that as well. The, the club were, were sort of undergoing a restructuring from a, a sort of fitness, sports science and nutrition perspective. So I went in alongside um, Mark Ellison, who's, who's still the nutrition consultant there at the moment. Um, and then sort of work with that, the next 10 seasons, it was... I mean, it was fantastic experience for me and sort of progressed every year, chopped and changed in terms of what I did, my roles, research, PhD, um, and I pretty much did every responsibility under, I'd say, the sports science umbrella during my time. Um, and again, so 10 years, 10 seasons later, um, came out to the States and to work with a a group of Olympic athletes, uh, Olympic sprinters, and essentially to develop a framework of sort of science, performance, innovation around their sort of training process. Um, and then since I've tra transitioned into 
more, I would say, consultancy work with some professional teams in the States and some project work in the NBA, MLB, um, and also working with um, Intel, the technology company as well. So now I'm sort of more project-based work um, on a full-time basis, which is um, which is amazing and exciting and doing things that I didn't think I'd be I'd be involved in. And I think, again, we'll probably talk about this, the sort of natural progression of a sports scientist or a fitness coach, um, sort of like going a little bit off track, but I think that's something that is is, is developing and increasing as well uh, in, in recent mm-hmm. years. So, yeah. Nice. That would be a whistle-stop tour. Nice, mate. As, a, as growing up as a Man United fan, as I did, I'm desperate to know what it was like to work under under Sir Alex. What was that like as a as a as a department with him at the obviously him at the at the helm, but then his transition out of that position and other people coming in and what was that like? Given that I know you you weren't there for his obviously his whole time, but it was a you know it was a stalwart of the English Premier League, and then that kind of came to an end and it all went a little bit weird. From a from a from a fan perspective, I suppose. But firstly, what was it like to work under under him? Yeah. F- firstly, were you a Man United fan in Yorkshire? Don't say that. Don't don't say that too loud. Oh, I was, was I was mate. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because my my dad was because he'd grown up through the Busby Babes and the Air Disaster and all that kind of thing, and just kind of taken Man United as a as his team. And then I got I got the jeans and had every. Man United kit under the sun from the green and yellow with the kind of laces and the black kit and you know I could I could probably name them all yeah through and through yeah I mean it's, oh yeah it's like I was I was a massive United fan I, was, I sort of lived 14 miles from like the stadium and grew up actually I had a season ticket for a number of years which I didn't actually disclose when I when I first got the job I, I wanted to try and keep it as like separate as possible but i mean that process get by oh, going in there it was again like i sent that research and i sent that research to from a master's to like i said like who i knew were actually working as a fitness coach or sports scientists in in football and i think as well the first thing like i was persistent and i, I sort of persevered and i think that's something that's really key and there's been a big thing for me in, in my career so far. And the, the three that actually got back to me was, was Tony Shrugwick, John Iger, who was at Wolves at the time, and also Nick Broad at Chelsea, uh, and spoke to all three. And again, Tony had a, a big interest in what I was doing. I think they, the team as well had just um, got some GPS units. So I think my background in, in using that from, again, back in 2007 was, I think, something that, was, was attracted to them. And again, we were talking for a number of months and then it came where, listen, this position needs to be filled and met with the doctor, Steve McNally. And then it was interview with Sir Alex, which was like still to this day, just a, a crazy, crazy situation. And I mean, it was, it was nothing, it was nothing about the role. It was all about trust, loyalty, like what I think he had sort of built a foundation at that club on um, as group of staff players, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy, but I mean, I was, when I got that job, I was 23 at the time and it was, I'm not, I'm not going to let this go. This is an unbelievable opportunity for me in a role, but also being amongst great practitioners and great staff. So when I went in, obviously Tony was the sort of the, head of fitness and conditioning. Um, and then there was Richard Hawkins, who was human performance manager. Gary Walker was there as well. So there was already a, a really, really good group of group of staff who I could learn from and, and develop myself as a, a practitioner. And that was something that, and I'll probably mention Strudders quite a lot, but he wanted to make the staff like it was a generalist approach, like everyone might be able to do all the different roles and develop me as well as a young practitioner, the different kinds of responsibilities required. Um, and again, from then it was more about specialism. Was Warren Gregson there or was that before you? Yeah. So, so that was, 
that's probably, that was probably a year later. And that's where the sort of PhD and the research um, sort of started. And, and this, and this came from, it was the manager, it was Sir Alex's question. It was always about, he would ask Struds and the department, like, where's my players at? Where's he at? Is he ready to train, play? And like, we would, we would know intuitively from some of the things we were doing, but we could never really answer it in, in the way we really felt confident in, in, in making an impact. And at the time, through, I think, Tony's link with Liverpool John Moores, Warren was was doing some consulting around the side. And as part of that, um, I, I, I had an interest in sort of furthering the research side, having come from a research master's. Um, and again, there was this question that kept coming up about, are my players ready? And that, for me, that's what sports science is about and what should be about and what should be emphasised more and more, particularly in in, in recent years. And it should be a, a broadened question from the, the most important people, whether that's the, the manager, the coach, even players or front office or sort of key stakeholder staff. And I think then it's up to us as a group of practitioners or researchers, ideally both. And like, when I say that, I mean that continuum of academics, pure practitioners and meeting in the middle. Um, and for those people who are a better place to answer those questions in the right way. So it all sort of came together with sort of my passion to, to keep researching real world questions, a real world question from the, the head coach, the manager, which, which, which again, the, at the time, Premier League, we know from the research, like in terms of physical demand was increasing, fixtures in terms of frequency were increasing and, and the time in between were, was, was getting less and less. So it was it was really relevant and and again i think tony's philosophy as a department was to be so innovative as well and that also came from the manager in what he'd done over the last um 18 years it would have been at that time so warren was my um, supervisor for this sort of phd project in again how do we monitor athletes and understand recovery status or fatigue status or readiness whatever you want to call it um to better make to better impact decision making for for a head coach. So through that through that process, obviously there was publications along the way, which was the PhD. But how was that then feeding? I suppose your knowledge feeding back day to day to him to try to answer them questions because it's all right doing a PhD and say yeah, I'll have that answer in uh, in six months. Well, that's not particularly going to cut it. I'm guessing that's on a day to day basis. He's still asking that them questions. So how was that gap? I suppose, bridged for you and the manager? Yeah, and it's, that's the interesting one. I think, so I think my, my PhD was one of the, I think it was the first one in the UK. It was like this embedded PhD sort of program, although it was different to the likes of like Liverpool and and, and how they sort of um, went down that path. Although, we, again, it, it was through John Moore's university, but first and foremost, I had a job to do every day from a sports science fitness perspective. So, it was it was a little bit different, and I think one thing about a PhD, which I think people sometimes forget, it's an, it's an education as well. At the end of the day, it's not right. I want to do a PhD, and that's that. It's you you go down a pathway of educa- of education, which is a process. And again, that question you've asked that is a, that is a fundamental aspect of that pathway, and. The way we set it up was we would collect the data collection that we were we were doing on a on a on a seasonal basis was with the first team athletes and so as we it's it's, it's really interesting because as we started at the time we were actually using I'm not sure whether this is a sponsor of yours but <laughs> another, <Carry on. laughs> another piece of equipment um, which I know they spanked a bit of cash on which was one of the areas I was looking at in the PhD in terms of heart rate variability. And just like the method of collection and then again, black box numbers is another story, but it didn't fit. We actually soon realized this information that we are, we are using this. We are using this on a, or we have been using this, but then we have, we started to understand greater intelligence about that tool, which meant we probably should maybe rethink this decision. And so we would like, we would maybe transition things out of that process. And so it's like, if, if 
if we are monitoring fatigue and we have a, a whole host of metrics that we can use, which are trying to quantify various origins of fatigue or systems and like the top of the funnel, as we go through that process of reliability, validity, sensitivity, what is practically going to work with this group of players and this management, you start to sieve out some of the ones, you know what, well, on the, for this basis, that's not, that's not going to be useful. And, that, and I, I've always termed it like the four pillars of confidence where you have, first of all, reliability, validity, sensitivity, and then usability. And like, if you can tick each of those pillars, I think then you can start to, to really create a sophisticated system around, again, in this case, it was monitoring recovery or fatigue. Uh, but it's, it's, that's a, that's a very difficult question to answer because we'd also go down pathways where, well, we could use the reserve team for other potential, um, intelligence pathways. So it might have been, well, and again, like, like research is, it creates more questions. And so if we, if we created a question through the first team, well, and, and not to make this sound like they're guinea pigs. Cause we would never, we would never like that, but we would test a few other questions, maybe on the reserve team, but that might've been more relevant to what they're doing. It may, it, it may have been like the, we knew the reserve team, the physical demands were actually higher. So is there something more relevant in that situation that we could maybe look to answer? So it was a very much a dynamic approach. Um, and there's certain things we were testing, but we had the confidence. We were doing things the right way. We were going, through a process the right way in real good quality research, great team behind that research and myself. And we were confident that we know actually we were using this, but we actually know now that it's probably not the best thing to use. So let's move on to the next thing. So I think that was, that was to summary, to summarize probably how we really intuitively went down that, that road. Mm -hmm. From some of the stuff that, interviews that maybe you've done or Strud's has done or various other people have done around United at that. On reflection, it seems like it was almost the pinnacle for a sports scientist because of the impact that you guys were having and the access that you had to the head coach back and forth, not only you going to him, but him coming down to you. Did that how it, is that how it felt at the time? Yeah, I mean, when I, I, I walked into it and there was the utmost trust between Tony and the department at the time and assistant manager, first team coaches and the manager. So it was, it was, it was walking into that. You never, I never really thought about it because whatever you did, the lines of communication, whether it was to, to Tony or to the assistant manager, the, the trust pathways were there and that information was again, was, was, was passed up in the most appropriate manner. So at the time, you never really thought about it. It's only when if the changes in that management structure occurred, which on then alternated those pathways where you, then, you maybe did think, actually, we had, we had it pretty good there. Like it was, it was almost easy. I mean, that being said, as a group of like practitioners, we would challenge each other. And that was a great thing. It was always done in the right way but it, whether it was Gary Walker or Rich Hawkins or, or Tony, or as the department grew, we had people like David Kelly and Paolo Gaudino. And again, Mark Ellison, nutritionist, we had people who came in all with their different expertise. And I think it was a, I feel looking grateful to have been a part of that to, and to how that developed me as a, a practitioner. But again, I think once, changes in management or structure occurs, which is normal. Like we're not the process. We have to adapt to the process. That's when you start to realize some of those, those things you maybe took for granted. But then again, on the other side of things, it, it makes you, I think a better practitioner because we have to adapt to different situations. And if a different manager wants to focus on something else, then we should adapt to that. And that, that comes back to the, like, is it sports science or science sport almost? Like, what, which, where are we in this process? And obviously not getting too ahead of ourselves of dictating. And that, and you know what? I remember, I think it was in the summer, I think Gary Neville quoted, I think with all like the, the new COVID um, restrictions and how that would affect the game and fixture congestion. 
and the prep, I think mainly it was more about the preparation period. And he said, oh, it's not going to be good for sports science or sports scientists won't like it. Well, isn't that what we're here to do? Like we're here to adapt and you know what? We've got a new issue. This is a new question. We need to find new answers. So in, in a way, I think it's great. Like it gives sports scientists, fitness coaches, S&C coach, whatever you want to call them or us, like something to dig our teeth into and understand more. And yeah, let's try and find some, like marginal gains or some real impact in in how we work, and because that's what we're here for. I can't let it go without asking you about Sir Alex as a man, as a as a leader. What what was it like being under his his leadership and how he dealt with not only you as a practitioner in the department and how he communicated with with that, but you as a person or the department as as people as as Tony as all the different individuals, what was it like working under him as a guy? Yeah, I think, well, firstly, I mean, there's, there's people who, who worked under him for a lot longer duration than me. But from from the time that I did, the, the main one was, and this is the example that I think I've given to a few people, of like a, an indication of, of like what he was like. Because everyone says like, as a man manager, he was amazing. And when I finished my PhD, and um, like I didn't, I didn't sort of. He'd he'd retired by then, but it was obviously it came from his question, and it, it was started through him. And I actually I got a phone call on a Sunday, and ironically, actually, I'd been I'd just been out the night before celebrating my PhD with my mates, um, and I, I couldn't answer the phone for I don't I can't remember what the reason was, but I was so happy I didn't because it was Sir Alex. He left a voicemail which I still have now and I can keep for obviously the rest of my life. And it was him like congratulating me for like completing it and how I'd like the sort of the, the sacrifice and work that I put in for that. And I think like, again, he didn't, he didn't need to, to do that. I didn't need to find out he did that, but somehow he did. And again, I've got that now for the rest of my life. And it was in a way I was, I was happy. I, I missed the call. So I think that that just shows I think in terms of like how he was with personnel. And again, I was one of hundreds of of staff that probably worked for him over the, the course of his career. So it's uh yeah, amazing. And just the trust, I think the trust that he, he put in in us and in Tony, I think was was amazing for us to be a part of. Did you call him back? No, it was it was a withheld number. Of course it was. Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's have a little chat around that transition of Sir Alex moving on and, and what came next. How was that for you guys? And you mentioned you you had to adapt to the process. Was the because obviously Moyes came in after that didn't particularly last too long. Then it was I'm trying to get the timelines right. Then it was Van Hal, then Mourinho. Yeah. Giggs Mourinho. Giggs Mourinho. So that them transitions, like, was there any positives that got taken out of them transitions away from Sir Alex that you could do that you couldn't do before or was it all about you just all I guess all of you adapting to the new like we are now adapting to the new normal of a new manager and new philosophies and new methodologies how did that affect you as a as a sports scientist and a, as a practitioner yeah I mean so it the stuff that was born out of that sort of Sir Alex period, I think moving forward, it was then beginning to really grow because it, I mean, these process don't, it, it doesn't take, it's not like a year or six months or even two years and like, bang, you've done it. Like that intelligence was, was growing from what, from what we knew. And again, the research that was, that we were doing, particularly myself around just seeing if players were ready or not. And how we could affect that that was that was growing as well and again we were publishing as we went um so the the initial phase things didn't really i'd say change there was there was differences in training philosophy and again football training just isn't just football training i mean different managers is, and i think there's going to be some work that will come out that shows that the physical demands are different so that period, we were just still really understanding how we could really 
approach some of these problems. But I think with the, I think it was probably more a, a new group of coaches and different lines of communication and pathways and trust, which I think probably was the, the main thing I would say. But in that, it, this was probably the first time where under, I would say David Moyes where me, myself as a, as maybe someone who had a, a specialism in an area was almost like called upon to, to be a decision maker, I would say. And, and not, not in a, I'm trying to find the right way to, to put this, but it was about, there was, a, there was a time where there was a decision that needed to be made on European travel. And up to this point, we'd done quite a lot in understanding how uh, the players were responding and what was going on when we were traveling and traveling back and using some of the, the monitoring strategies and processes along the way, we were able to really understand whether or not, and this was a question that we always had was, do we stay over in Europe or do we come back straight away? And again, sometimes that's taken out of your control from logistics and airports, etc. But we was we, we we actually collected data where we did both. When it was out of, when it wasn't under our control, what would how did the players respond through some of these again monitoring measures, etc. From if we travel straight away back, we'd always get home at three, four in the morning, or if we stayed over and travelled the next sort of mid morning. And it was fa- and, and the data showed it was favourable to to stay, and not just from that acute period, but what we saw in the sort of week following. And this was a question that. David Moyes at the time. And I remember getting a call from his secretary saying, like, Robin, they want a manager wants to speak to you about this area. And I was like, that was the first time I think it was called upon for me to give my imp- impact. But this was like, by now, like five years in the making, really, like of all the work that we'd done. And so I'm sat there for the first time and it's like the manager, all the coaches, the club secretary and me. And it's like, well, what should we do? And that was like, it, that was a, in terms of job satisfaction and that's something that's massive, I think, in professional teams at the moment and where people find job satisfaction and impact. Like for me, you know what? I'm involved in a, a decision which involves the team, European travel, and there's big stakes there. So like for me, that was, that was an amazing time for me to start. Well, actually, this is my value to a professional sporting team and to players. So albeit things might change communication wise, things were still developing. And again, that was, that was something that was really impactful for my career as well. It gave me the confidence and you know what? Yeah, we have done the research. We've, we've done this the right way. We understand we're doing, we're monitoring the right way. We're not just picking any metric out of thin air and running with it and saying, you know what? We believe this is right, which happens all the time, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, yeah, so that was, that was, that was, that was a, a big moment for me. And I think that carried on into, into the Van Gaal era, I think even more so. And I mean, that, this, that was almost my, I, I, and I bore people to death with this story, but so like, again, this monitoring framework had been built, it was growing, the intelligence was there. We were, it was, we were a really good position. And I think one thing I've not mentioned yet is that from the manager, you get the buy-in from the players. So if, if the, the players see the manager's bought in and has trust, then the players will, will generally follow suit. I think that's a massive thing. Um, and that was, you know what, that was something from the very beginning when we started the project of, of my role in this recovery area. It was the start of the season. This was back in the Sir Alex days. It was a team meeting at the start of the season and Tony presented and said, listen, we're going down this road. We're going to focus on this area. We've got Robin who's going to be leading it. Who's going to do it through proper research, but it's applied. He's there working every day. That instilled this like trust and I would say an emphasis to the player, the importance that like this is, this is, this is really going to be crucial for us. So that was all, that was born years before. So all, all the things that happened afterwards with that group of players, that's, and that's where we were lucky. And I think there's a different, there's a general a generational change in our thinking players, which I noticed throughout the time. Because back then I was, we were working with Rio Ferdinand, Ryan Giggs, Gary Neville, Paul Scholes, these types of players. Um, and so anyway, so back into the sort of Bangal era, a new manager comes in, 
um, normally it's, yeah, what do you do? You present to the manager, this is what we've been doing. This is how we can help you. And again, a lot of the emphasis for the new managers and coaches is on the technical side, of course. Um, and so he was like, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. I like it. Um, let me know sort of what you find, etc. A little bit of a, like he liked it, but he was happy for it to be sort of at the side a little bit. And then it was funny. So one game at this point, it must have been like two two months into the season and we would continue to do stuff. We were making decisions on it from a, a performance team, a medical team. And he, he, I walked past him in the corridor. It was a day before a game and we were, the training load was, was massive. And like p- players weren't used to this. And again, this is another conversation, but he said, oh, is anyone at risk tomorrow? And he, he would always like throw like, he would put comments out there and stuff. And at this time there was a, there was a player who like, it was through every measure that we were assessing in terms of load and I would say percent increases like between weeks, not, not any sort of ratio. Um, like it was, it was, it was obvious. And I was like, you know what? I've been doing this for two months. We're making decisions, but the management aren't really embracing it. I was like, you know what, boss, this player, I think is a risk. And I, and I just, and I, I just threw my hat on it. I was like, you know what? I'm confident in this. This has been, go back to the, our previous discussions. This data I'm confident in, like, it's not something I've just pulled out of thin air. He went, okay, okay. And then 30 minutes into the game, one, three, the player um, tears his groin. And so, and again, to be, to be clear, none of this is, none of the, the monitoring stuff that I do is about prediction or anything like that. It's about mitigating risk and just building pieces of a puzzle to understand what's going on with that player at that particular time. And the next day, I was walking past him again and he, he shouted me, winked at me and went, you were right. And I was like, yeah, he's, he's sort of just, just having a bit of banter with me. And then the next day he was like, listen, he called me to his office and said, the three days before every game now, you report to me in terms of the fatigue status of my players. And I was like, all right. And then at the time, all the team would, would eat together at lunch and dinner. And he said at lunchtime, you come and sit next to me in front of the players. And then he stood up after everyone had eaten, told me to stand up next to him. He said, he gave a spiel about for three months or something, uh, Robin Thorpe has been right about every decision in this sort of process, which was obviously bullshit. But like the most important one, it, it sort of turned out right. And he said, he will be now like advising me with regard to this information, this like intelligence. And then like little team like clapping and stuff. Cause it's a lot of them had seen me come from like being coming in as like a young practitioner and sort of developing through. And and from there it was like we developed such a like a great process to monitor how these players were responding to load and to stress and to games. And the manager was using it. And the performance team was using it. Like with the with like say Gary Walker in, in the gym or with the medical team or with the club doctor, Steve McNally, we were we were using this information to impact the players and the process. So it was, that was a, just off that one particular incident, it, it sort of changed how the manager at the time used information, how I worked. And the, I would say the importance of my delivery to, to staff, etc. So, but I mean, that being said, there was also a, a cultural and a social factor where now players see, wait a minute, like, can you then trust if he can you trust him now if the manager's getting this information and that's always something which probably people don't think about and i think that's where as a practitioner how you speak with people with players you interact with them i think is is hugely important 
because there was times where I had players come up to me and was like, oh, the manager's told me I'm not in the team because of you. And so like data can be switched around. That's where you got to be really careful. And I think, again, as you as a person, how you interact with players and how you deliver information is, is really, really important. Can, can we dive into that a little bit more? So I think that's yeah. fascinating because I've got that here, like player buy-in, and we, we've chatted about it with players of the kind of era before that were big drinking cultures. And you've even got the, some of the players that you mentioned who were at the back end of that and have been kind of dragged into this era of, of sports science. And then you get used to next to the manager. And in my mind, I've got like, these players must just be like thinking that you have a lot of answers and you can be really impactful. And then you say that at the end about that being switched around. And I think that's really interesting. How did you, how did you cope with that? How did you try to keep them on side with still doing your day-to-day role of or three days before a match of advising the manager and that that playing out how does that all work together to allow you to keep doing what you think is best for the players yeah well, that's what you just said is, is is the most important thing it's about the player so before this like i said like we were that i would be understanding what potentially recovery intervention or what prescription in the gym should be used based off the monitoring. That was why we did, we were doing it. We wanted to better understand where the player is at from a stress perspective, and then understand what is the most appropriate intervention. And the last thing we wanted to do was impact the training process. That's like, let me be clear about that. That was, we didn't want to do that. I mean, the, the furthest we would go would be like, oof, like, because again, it was two days after a game was always that key time point. And that's when we did all our monitoring, like in terms of a battery of assessments. Because that's when the, the the manager wanted players back in the the training process, and again, that's where we found most variability between a group. And so, typically, there would be a portion of players who are ready to go back and train and load. Because again, one thing that's maybe a misconception about sports science or some of the work maybe I've done is that it's about holding players back. Like if we found that a player was ready to go two days two days after a game, I was like, right. To, to Gaz, Gary Walker, let's load him in the gym. Like we've got an opportunity to, to adapt like and, and get some gains. It's not about pulling him back, but there's times where there's a player on that second day to put him back in the training process would be, it'd be like, oof, like can he cope with some of that? Like we, kn- we know the gaffer wants to train hard two days after a game. And so that, again, it's about adapting. And that also comes back to what we do from a recovery point of view anyway. Like, if the gaffer wants to train hard two days after a game, then let's forget about adaptation in terms of what recovery strategies we want to use. It's all about consolidating recovery. Again, that's probably another discussion altogether. Um, but going back to like that social impact of like, or the sociology between players and, and manager, like it's the manager may have some of his own reasons why he's, giving players information about why or why, why or why not they're playing or they're training, for example. And if if I'm used as a reason, then that's his decision. I've got to try and I don't that's I'm separate to that. I need to deal with how I respond to that. And so for me, when I talk with players and how I get buy-in from players, it's always about education. So if I'm measuring heart rate variability with a player and we see through our statistical process that we know there's a a change and it's in a certain direction we now have like a decision making tree of what things we can do to help that particular issue or that particular origin of fatigue or recovery and for me it was about educating those players that don't depend on me to give you that information if i give you the data then you i want you to intuitively know what you need to do so for example from a if we, t- if we t- look at cold water immersion, for example, if part of our process, we had a re- like a, an increase in muscle soreness. Again, all, not just arbitrary, oh yeah, it's gone up by one point. Something that we know from an individual level that's changed for, for the detriment. And we know that maybe heart rate variability has reduced to a more sympathetic dominant state in that, again, in the athlete to their norms then I want the athlete to understand. Well, if I see that data from Robin or from whoever, I know 
cold water immersion is probably a good idea today or, to, or, or whatever it may be. It might not, that's just one example. So that was always, it was always an education process with the players. But there, was an, in, there, was, there were occasions where it may be used against you. And you have to, again, that's where you have to be able to deal with people and deal with people from different cultures who have got way more on the line than you. And again, that's where trust with those players is key. And that, that actually happened. I had a player who came up to me and said, the manager told me I'm not in the squad because of the data. And it's, then you are in a position and you've got to manage that. How did you get him back round? Well, again, I think we, from what we put in place prior and maybe senior players buying in and a culture that we had of, we're doing this for you. This is for your benefit. We're not doing this because we want to just collect data. And again, this isn't to do with anything with team decision-making. This is about us creating the best support structure for you as an athlete and a human being. And that's what it would always be like. So I think the trust issue, the trust was there between me and that player. And, and again, thankfully due to that, it didn't get to a point where, well, you know what, I'm never turning up to, to get any assessment from you or I'm not listening to you ever again. So, but I mean, they're, they're things you, I think only probably experience gives you the, the, the tools to deal with. When you say... But again, it's a way as well where it's been really beneficial. Of course. I mean, when, when you... And you know, environment you've got to be savvy like i remember when and that's one thing i learned massively from the likes of like tony and and rich and, and people there that like you got to be savvy in those environments and those circumstances and yeah you only you only learn that from from being there and doing it and getting and making a whole lot of mistakes and getting getting smashed by players and from staff so we've gone through so Alex, we've gone through a little bit of Moyes, Van Hal, and then Jose. Talk us through that and some of the things that again elaborate on some of the things that we've spoke about, the positives that had happened through that through your career, and then what was able to be carried on in Jose's reign, and maybe what wasn't, and maybe reasons why, if 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 you know. Yeah, yeah. So this at this stage. Um, again, it was the, the usual, you, you meet the manager and you, you show him what you do, what you've done, how you can help him. That's the most important thing. And he was from, in terms of the, like the response monitoring, if I want to call that, or like the management healthcare system, whatever we want to, however we want to term it, he was fine with can, for us to, to do that and, and give him information. And so that, that continued, um, and there was, there was definitely early on, there were times where I would report on in terms of we were, we were playing Europa League at the time. And um, so it was a, that was a new test for us because we'd never really done the Thursday, Sunday. And there's all these, all the chat around the Thursday, Sunday turnaround and all that, all the rest of it. So it was about, well, from what we had previously, can we quantify a sort of a generic recovery ability of the athletes and then again and that's the information we provided who who we thought could could deal with with a potential turnaround like that across a season so there was there was some things like that which were which were used to to great effect and to, to give again the manager the most important person at the time like the the right information i think following that there was more of a shift towards I think in terms of monitoring and impact in the rehab setting. And again, this, this wasn't an area we'd really devoted a lot of, um, not, not time, but a lot of insight into particularly in the past. So for me, it was, well, if, if we're, we're having limited access, maybe from a, a fit group of players over the course of a season, can we, can we adapt as a department myself and, and go into a different area to, to still benefit the manager and the team. And so we looked more into sort of the rehab process um, and how we could better monitor, I would say, yeah, from early stage rehab going into return to competition. So, but so that, that was more where our focus slide. And I think at that point for me as my career, I sort of, again, through restrictions in, particular responsibilities it was more well 
you, I, I moved a little bit more towards the S and C side again, mm-hmm. and that's and that's almost that's what how that's how it began anyway. I was a fitness coach really, and so it just gave me an an opportunity to to sort of go down that route and and get impact for the team and and job satisfaction and and purpose. I would say in, in that sense. And again, I was still at this point. I'd always been managing the recovery process between games in terms of the actual session the day after or whatever, or whether individuals are in that period on other days between games. Um, so that was always happening um, throughout that process. Um, but I remember one, one, one story and I'm not, so when I was doing, so when I started my PhD in the research, I said to myself like every year, and this was, a, and this was also backed by, by Warren Gregson, who was, who'd always like, push me to do this. It was like, I want to, I want to present some original research, a good scientific conference every year, every summer. Like that was my aim to, to get this work out there. Like it's all about, and I remember Barry Drust, who was on my supervisory team, he was always like, you know what research, it's just, people just need to read it. So that was a chance for me to, to do that. And again, that, that also, it, it gave me exposure and it put me in that group of people and that environment, the more academic side. I think that's, that was really important for me to keep one foot like in this sort of academic circle and one, and again, but being a practitioner day to day, I think that's something I was told years and years ago that you can't do both. Um, and that was, that just gave me more motivation and determination to, you know what, I'm going to be a practitioner, but I'm going to make sure that how I work is I implement scientific rigor in everything that I do and in every decision that I make and go into ECSS back in the day. In fact, that's another funny story. My first conference, scientific conference at ECSS. And, um, I was like, I was shitting myself actually, but, um, it was a pretty big audience and because I was, I was, I was, it was the first time I was presenting some of my work and there were some good people in the audience. And I was like, ah, oh, I hope I don't get like a, a curveball question. And, there were, and of course there was some like, sort of some decent stats involved with, with the research. And the first question I got was Will Hopkins. And I was like, and it was, I was, that was like, of, I mean, in terms of stats at the time, it was, but the guru. Was, yeah. So it was, and then two years later, actually, I was presenting a stats paper as well, a statistical approach type paper in Copenhagen. And I was like, oh, like, please, not another like stats guru is going to come up and, and, and bash me. But I mean, from that point of view, and I'm, I'm circling around mad, like in, like in madness now, but. Part of, my, part of my supervisory team, my PhD, um, Greg Atkinson was was part of that. And there's for someone who can explain sophisticated stats in such a understandable manner, he, he's he's incredible. And I've been very lucky in, in terms of the from a research perspective. And again, going back to what I'm talking about, is like being involved in that that community, having people like Greg, like Warren, uh, Barry. And, and mine, Bushai as well, like it, that I, I was lucky and grateful to have that sort of support structure around me. Um, and then that's something that I continue to do. And again, having one foot in the academic world, but also one foot in the practitioner world and trying to culminate the two, I think it's very important to me and something that I'm continuing to do. And at the moment with my current um, like role as a sort of consultant or with multiple projects, it's given me a bit more time to to focus on some of that that research that we that we've we we've been doing for sort of 10 years but getting it out there and trying to make a difference to to that sports science world that that is now do you think people practitioners do that enough i mean you've clearly got that ingrained in you now that's, that's a big thing for you that you do marry up though that academic and the practical do you think that's for everyone or do you think people should be going down that similar route? Not not necessarily publishing, but just having that in the 
one area of the mind that that has to have a constant thread throughout? Yes, I do think so. I think, I think if you don't, and again, this is just my opinion, but I, I don't. If you don't, I think we can get lost in, particularly from a data point of view and the metrics and the technology era that we're in, we can get lost in some of these um, metrics and how they actually can inform professional sport or something on the front line. So for example, again, just my opinion. So if we talk about force platforms and about the hundreds of metrics that we can get from a force platform, and, if, and are people really making decisions based off some of these metrics? Because if they are, I'm, I'm hoping that they understand some of the noise in some of these metrics. I'm hoping they actually understand them and they're not hugely contrived. And are they sensitive to change in stress? And what is a, what is a meaningful change in some of these metrics? Because not much of that information is available but I know a lot of people or organizations are using that technology. So I think by going through or having, having exposure to that academic side or being a, a, a practitioner who is heavily or continually involved in that side, I think is really important. You mentioned, and just is, we're going to go, I'm going to go back one more time to what you've said, then we're going to push on. You mentioned that the monitoring that was going on to make to allow you to make decisions on what was going to go on match day plus one, match day plus two. What exactly, what data exactly were you collecting? You mentioned HRV, which you potentially moved away from at, at certain points. But what was what was actually being collected that you were using to determine what was going back to the manager and therefore potentially affecting training? Yeah. So, so at the beginning, the process was right. There's this whole bunch of metrics we can use so it was understanding first what's important to measure so if we're looking at if a player is ready or if we're looking at the response the athlete has to stress and load what are the systems or origins of those areas that we want to try and quantify so that's how we started and then you go through the the next phase or what can we actually do like in this applied environment and at that time, it was like, well, there's no point pricking people and getting blood samples because it's just not going to happen from from many different factors, from monetary to, I'm not sure I know any athlete who wants to do that on a daily basis. Because a lot of these things we know in football and in every team sport, the peaks and troughs in load and stress, uh, the range is quite big. So some of these things we're going to need to be doing probably daily. So... The first thing was, well, let's find a group of subjective or sort of self-reported outcome measures to to ask the players. And then it was, well, what, what are the other systems we want to try and quantify? So um, trying to quantify what the autonomic nervous system is doing was important. So is there something from a submaximal heart rate perspective, heart rate recovery, heart rate variability, resting heart rate? Those were sort of grouped together because we knew we could probably practically do that with the players and we could probably find a way of doing it quite um i would say in in a novel way i would say from what had been done previously um and then for, following that we sort we then started to add a few to the to the sort of system and one thing was, for me was how do we integrate the medical department within this this isn't just like performance science and s and c this is let's just have a holistic view because one of the reasons why we looked at HRV was the club doctor, Steve McNally, was very interested in that because of the clinical aspects to it. So for me, it was about trying to integrate and, and bring everyone together and using data as like the sort of common language, so to speak. And then again, we had some of the more strength or force related measures. So we could use a force platform and we could look at counter movement jumps as the, as the sort of the thing to measure in terms of force application into the ground. So then you start to sort of bring these together. And again, oh, across along the journey, things were sort of removed, things were added. Um, one thing, a group of things that we added was some anatomical 
sort of structural measures, which were basically sort of range of motion assessments, typically done by a medical or a physiotherapist um, department. Um, and just understanding fluctuation, but we also looked at in looked at that in relation to pain as well. So at the height of what we were doing and delivering intelligence, the subjective sort of outcome related measures were a big part of that. And we did that every day. That wasn't just two days after the game, that was every day. And again, that's one thing people say it's easy to use subjective based metrics, whether it be RPE or these response sort of outcome measures. And it's certainly not easy. It's simple. Like you don't need much to do it, but you need to be educated how to de how to deliver that process and you need buying from a player. And so, and I've, I've spoken on this before where a lot of the time it's maybe a junior member of staff or the, these things get pushed back. But for me, I think, the athletes and the, the management need to see a lot of key stakeholders doing these types of measures or I, I would always try and divvy it out sometimes. But that's something that I, I collected subjective ratings from athletes for probably nine years. And there was times where we used, we looked at different methods of maybe using app based systems to prompt athletes to do it. Um, we, we looked at other members of staff as well. But for me, it was it was a gateway between a communication pathway and a, and a relationship. And it, and we would, we would look at soreness, fatigue, and sleep, having looked at other ones. And we thought, well, no reliability, no sensitivity, not really. And then we would, we went, went with these three, but then we was always, there was a statistical process in the background to know what was a real change, not just all oh, Wayne Rooney's gone from a four to a five. It was right. This is the change. And this is the sort of the level of change and 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 what we would do th thereafter so although we use subjective measures hugely like so, some of the background work involved with that was was massive it's really and again i was going to say it's really interesting you say that because i actually watched parts of tony's ukca football conference presentation which was like almost the day last year before we spoke and he spoke about the monitoring the subjectives been binned off onto the younger member of staff when actually that needs to be the the key the key guy like you are tony like should be collecting that kind of thing it's most important so it's interesting that you say that having not known that i actually watched that and you basically both said the same thing which is which is good which is great marries up yeah well i mean i think over the course and it goes back to what we discussed before about buy-in education. How do you how do you get compliant athletes? They've got they've got to be part of that process. They've got to believe in it as as we do. And again, like for me, as part of this process, it was it was my life for fact, like from a PhD point of view for five years, and from a a team perspective for ten seasons. It's so like, and at one point, I knew whatever day it was, I, I had in my mind where each player would be at based on this data because when we we're playing three games a week we were we were doing the the full battery monitoring assessments three times so if you're getting again i'll go back to it on that two days after a game as well as the subjectives we would do every day we would be doing these anatomical structural based assessments with pain we would be doing a submaximal test with heart rate so we could understand submax heart rate peak heart rate heart rate recovery, heart rate variability, resting heart rate. And then every sort of three weeks, we would then integrate the, the more force application measures. But again, as, as I've spoke, like this wasn't just set, this is what we did. If we had, we then started to bespoke it even more. And if players had history of hamstring injuries, for example, we would maybe add in more of a hamstring related strength assessment. If it was someone with a calf issue or etc etc so not only was it we were looking at every or we were trying to tick every system from a biological and physiological perspective but we we're also then starting to go well actually this is more relevant for this player let's hone in on this and so that was two days after every game and again this was i remember at one point during the bangal era um i i monitored 17 players through all of that myself 
then manage to understand the sort of statistical implications to each measurement and then report to the manager in 45 minutes. And so like it was, I mean, you're running around like a, like a blue ass fly, but it was, again, we believe, we believe in that process and we were able to, to then make decisions based off it. If it was a, a, it's a change with one of the anatomical measures. I would be able to go to Neil Huff, the head physio at the time. Here's the left and right. This is the data. And then he could then best utilize his skills or his department to change or to, to, to impact that player, whether that be before training or it's something we need to think about after training or is it something we have to come together as a department and say, actually, is the best thing for this player based off a number of these metrics to maybe change that training process which we didn't want to do but again if we we started to model a lot of this information and there'd be combinations of these metrics we were like we'd start to learn with real real critical um changes in combination so for example if a player reported again all all these changes i'm talking about a statistical process to change so if there's a, a negative change in muscle soreness an anatomical measure, whether it be hamstring or groin, and a HRV decline, that really coincided with, from our knowledge of previous data collected and subsequent change in the training process, this was an important combination for us. So if that came about, we would, we started to know, right, this is a big combination. Do we need to do, we need to do something about it? Do we in, like, inter, interject this, this process? And again, it, it worked well with, again, with the club doctor, Steve McNally, being involved with some of the HRV stuff, the sort of illness-related immune stuff on that side of things. Neil Huff was great, and we were trying to integrate that medical department as well. Um, so at the height of that, it was, it was a real interdisciplinary process with, again, management decisions off the back of it.